there was a driver who was just plagued with a string of accidents. Uh, it just seemed like one after the other. He hit a deer and then, you know, he backed into somebody. And have you ever had a string of accidents like that where it seems like, you know, I've driven for 20 years and I never had anything like that. And now it just seems like two, three times in a row. So anyways, he was, he was plagued by a, a, a string of accidents and he wasn't a careless driver. So a concerned friend uh, rode with him one day and his friend was thinking, I'm just going to see what's going on. Something changed. You know, what, why is this guy all of a sudden just getting into so many accidents? After driving with him for a while, his friend, the passenger, concluded that although uh, his friend was a careful driver, he spent so much time looking in the rear view mirrors that he wasn't uh, prepared for what was going to happen ahead of him. And Christians can learn much from the past. But uh, we have to keep our eyes focused on the future and the one who holds the future. We can get so caught up in what God has done previously. And, that, and that's important. We ought not to forget where we came from, what the Lord has done for us in our life. But if we get so caught up in the past and every conversation we have, every story we have is about the good old days or do you remember when? You ever meet those people who every story they tell, every whatever it is, uh, is all about when they were in high school. And you think, well, well, when I was in high school, and you're trying to tell them something currently, and oh, yeah, yeah, well, when I was in high school, it's like high school must have been the best four years of their life because that's what they always refer to. Have you ever, have you enjoyed something outside of that? And there's some people who just live in the past, and though it's not wrong to remember the past and remember from where you came, we also need to keep an eye focused on the future. And as a Christian, we need to focus on what God has for us in our life and what God has for Christians down the road and then focus on the one who holds tomorrow. That is our true hope and it's important not to become stagnant and complacent. That's the danger, right? When we always are looking in the rearview mirror and what God has done for us and hanging our hat on maybe, well, I remember this year I read through the Bible uh, all the way or this year, you know, I was really close to the Lord and I led people to the Lord you know, five years ago and we can become stagnant and complacent and it can become two, three, four, five years uh, removed from ever having grown in our Christian life or ever having reached someone new or passed out a track. So it's important that we not hang our hat on what we've done in the past or God has done for us. Really looking forward, I wrote, it down, wrote this down, prophecies about the future should change our lives in the present. So let's get into it. First, our life outlook, verses 11 through 13. The verse 11 reads it like this, is seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? We see that phrase, uh, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What, for, uh, what is he referring to? We'll look back in verse number 10. I've got to flip there just a second. Verse number 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Guys, your garage and all your hunting stuff, she's going to burn. Ladies, all your clothes, all of your jewelry, everything, your, the, the, your dream house, your forever home, uh, all of your stuff, gone. It's going to melt and explode. And Peter said, because of knowing that, seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Conversation there is not just referring to what we say. It's also referring to our way of life, our actions, what we do. Your life is your conversation. And our daily conduct is supposed to be different because we believe the biblical message that Jesus Christ is coming back. We're going to do a little exercise here in a minute, thinking about, not, don't worry, don't get, not actual exercise. All right, you can stay seated. Uh, a mental exercise. <laughs> Some of you got scared there for a second. A mental exercise about uh, thinking about Jesus Christ coming back. And then verse 12 reads like this, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God. That word hasting means being urged or pressed by business. Peter said we ought to be urging ourselves. We ought to be pressed, stressed in a word, unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. 
So what are we looking towards? What are we looking forward to? We're looking towards the day of God. Here's an interesting uh, tidbit, and I am not going to pretend that I understand or know all of it, uh, but I, I noticed this. In verse 10, we see a reference to the day of the Lord. We're looking towards the day of the Lord. But then in verse 12, it says, what do we see here? The day of God. And verse 12 seems to teach uh, or insinuate that the day of God follows the day of the Lord and acts kind of as the finale to the period of time known as the day of the Lord. We said the day of the Lord begins with the, when Jesus Christ comes back to earth to, to, to meet his uh, people. And then there's the tribulation and then there's the judgment. And it seems as though the day of God is kind of the end of the totality of the day of the Lord. In addition, the believer should look forward to not just the day of the Lord, the day of God, but also to the new heaven and the new earth after the destruction of the present heaven and the present earth. Because that is our eternal home. Our eternal home for believers is that new heaven and new earth uh, with Jesus Christ. I'll read this for a couple of verses uh, from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, verse 17. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That verse is often read uh, as a comforting verse at a, a funeral uh, or at a, a burial. Just the thought that we will be reunited together with the Lord and those who have gone on before who were saved and will live forever together with him, with Jesus Christ. Uh, and that is uh, the day of the Lord, the day of God. Look at verse 13 of our text. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The new Jerusalem, the new place where we are going to live. Uh, you could read all about it in uh, Revelations chapter 21, uh, verses 9 and forward. And it gives a description of uh, some of those things that John saw, right? And what that's going to look like. Pretty incredible uh, to think about uh, the place where we're going to spend forever, eternity. We're going to spend maybe 80, 90 years here on earth, but we're going to spend much longer than that uh, in the New Jerusalem with Jesus. Uh, this is the place, talking about New Jeru Jerusalem, that Christ promised to prepare for his saints. And all of these promises have a definite effect on Peter's outlook on life and also his daily walk. Peter said, listen, we talked about the fact that how scientifically, how God is going to end the world. He is going to, very possibly, the, the end of the world is going to be the largest atomic bomb that's ever been, ever, right? The elements are going to melt and everything is going to be gone. God's going to create something new for us, for the believer. And Peter said, because of that, we ought to have a completely different outlook on life. And we also ought to have a walk that is countercultural, that's different than everyone else's because we have a hope that's different than everyone else's. We know that Christ is coming back for us. Peter said that ought to change the way that you look at life and the way that you live your life. But here's something that I wanted to do kind of as a fun thing, but also as a thought-provoking thing. Think about uh, your answer to verse 11. Put your eyes on verse 11 again. It says, Seeing then all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of person ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Peter said, What kind of person would you be if you knew, if you believed that Jesus was coming back? So I want to pose the question this way. If you had one week before the Lord came back, what are some things that you would do in preparation for that? And what are some things that you would maybe stop, do, stop doing or, or you wouldn't do anymore, uh, knowing that Jesus was coming back on Sunday the 18th at 1020, one week from right now. Just open it up to conversation. Something you would do, something you wouldn't do. I, uh, I was thinking about some different things. I don't, I don't think I would watch much or any TV, right? Like, it, I, I just can't picture myself. I enjoy at the end of a day, after the kids go to bed, usually it's like 9, 
Kara and I usually just sit down and pop our earbuds in and just spend like maybe a half hour just kind of with no one else talking, no sounds whatsoever, and just kind of decompress uh, from the day. But I can't picture that I would do that. Maybe I would, but I just feel like we would try and be trying to take advantage of every second uh, in, in doing things. Where is something else that you would do or wouldn't do? Uh, if you knew the Lord was coming back in one week. Brother Jamie? Spend time together with family. Absolutely, it kind of puts things back into perspective. Someone else had a hand. Josh, I was thinking that too. I would not show up at work. Uh, I, I would be uh, done with that. Um, it would be kind of awkward if then he didn't come back and be like, "Oh yeah, uh, <laughs> no, uh, Miss Jen." <laughs> exactly. You would go soul winning and be eating shrimp the whole time. <clears throat> Try to reach as many people as you can and get eat as much as you with no guilt. It's a good idea. Someone else, Miss uh, Amy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be really the number one thing I think is all of a sudden. Um, the fear of being rejected by people soul winning uh, or the, uh, the, the urgency would definitely go up, right? You wouldn't care if it was like, oh, well, it's kind of a bad time right now. Like, I don't care. You got to listen to what I'm saying. It would become much more important trying to reach people with the gospel. That'd probably be the number one thing. Anyone else have a thought or input? What you would do, what you wouldn't do if you knew the Lord was coming back. Mm -hmm. Amen. Anyone else? Brother Schultz. Exactly. You just be doing what you're supposed to. I like that. Um, I was thinking about. Um, I would. I would be looking inwardly, and uh, don't make this work hard, harder than it should, but the Bible does talk about if we have a good account, if we judge ourselves, that we wouldn't be judged. I would be thinking a lot about, I'm going to be standing before the Lord giving account for every second. And I would want to make that weak count, but I would also uh, try to keep a short account and make sure that my relationship with God was right so that when all of a sudden now I'm standing in front of him giving account for every idle word, every idle deed, uh, that it would be a short account. But yeah, very good. So, but here's the thing, is we know that he's coming back. We don't know if it could be tomorrow or if we'll die and we'll never see the coming of the Lord you know, from a rapture standpoint, but we know he's coming back. So why should, if we believe the Bible and we believe his words, why should we not live like that every day? And that was a challenge to me when I was looking at this. But then uh, verse 14, it changes thought, but it's building on... Uh, the thought of the world ending and how we ought to live with that knowledge. Wherefore, uh, that word wherefore tells us that Peter's beginning a new subject, but he's building on the previous thought. Wherefore, uh, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. We're challenged here to be at peace with God. The only way to have true peace with God is to depend wholly on him. Uh, if we can trust God with our future... If we can trust God with really the, the biggest thing uh, that, that you would trust anyone with, your eternity, forever. If you can trust God with that for salvation, why uh, wouldn't we trust him with our present? Why wouldn't we trust him with now and the ordering of our circumstances in our life? Uh, and then verse 15 says, An account and that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. If you underline in your Bible, uh, that would be something that I would underline, that phrase. An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Um, I, don't, I was talking with somebody this week. It might have been you, Brother Larry. Um, we were talking about just some of the things that you just, it's hard to believe um, that are going on in, in the world. It's just hard to 
to believe that people get away with it, that it's legal, and uh, some things that are good are frowned upon or even uh, advised not to be done, and then things that seemingly are just terrible, uh, wicked acts are promoted and, and are legalized. Um, but looking at this verse and looking at that phrase uh, really changed my perspective. It's easy to become frustrated or discouraged that the world and the majority of mankind is becoming more and more sinful and less and less godly. But Peter challenges us to account, to take into consideration that God's long-suffering and his patience in judgment and in coming back is not because he has forgotten about us or that he wants all of these things to be done, but because he wants everyone to be saved. He wants to give everyone a chance. Why is God long-suffering? Why is he patient? It says here his long-suffering is salvation. It is, he is giving everyone an opportunity uh, over and above really what he ought uh, because of his mercy. Um, in verse Verse 15 of this passage agrees uh, with verse 9 uh, that we would have looked at a couple days ago. Let's take a look at that. A uh, very common verse. Look at the last part of the verse. But is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When you get frustrated about what's going on in the country or the world today, think about the long suffering of God. Aren't you glad that He was long suffering for you? Aren't you glad that Christ didn't come back or levy judgment on the world before you got saved? And then in light of that, in light of his mercy, that was a huge benefit to you. Think about that for, and, and the huge impact that that makes for those who will get saved today and get saved next week. It makes a big difference to them too. And uh, uh, the next time you become frustrated with the way our country is going or discouraged with recent events, tell someone about Christ. Because it's the extra time that God has given us. It ought to be filled with diligent sharing of his gospel, not bitterness and discouragement. And that's a, another, a, a huge challenge to me and, and uh, sitting in my office and thinking, man, what a, what a great perspective to have. And I don't always have that perspective. It's easy to, you know, fuss and complain and poo-poo on the, you know, the government and, you know, the, the, the White House or whatever. But God is with extending the time that we have here on earth. So we have more time to share. I put it this way. Uh, it's not an original quote, but I love uh, the mental picture. The waters of God's judgment are beating against the dam of his mercy. And God is going to judge. He's going to set everything straight. And it's all going to uh, be according to his judgment. God is a just God. He has to levy judgment where judgment is due. But also because of his mercy, he's withholding that. Um, let's keep going. Verse 16. Also, uh, in all his epistles. Also, oh boy, for some reason I can't get the word as. There we go. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. It's kind of a wordy verse there, but there's a couple things we see in this verse. Peter notes that Paul's writings can be hard to be understood. If you read the book of Romans uh, or any of the uh, you know, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, sometimes there's words and verses in there that are, just like Peter said, hard to be understood. And, uh, but it doesn't mean that we ought not to read them or study them and say, well, you know, I just, you know, I, I just don't get that you know, book of Romans. If you read in the book of Romans at all, there is so much. Uh, I would say uh, if I could only choose one portion out of the Bible to keep, and you had to get rid of everything else. You know, you ever see those things, you know, those little, uh, uh, you can only keep one, and there's like, you know, cake, pie, ice cream, or whatever. Uh, if I had uh, books of the Bible, and you could only keep one, I'd keep the book of Romans. It has everything you need for salvation, for how you ought to live your daily life. So we ought not to say, oh, I, I just don't, I don't understand the Bible. It's too hard to understand. Let me ask you this question. Are you a student of the Word? Uh, don't, don't, don't say you can't understand it. Study it deeper. But also, you see, Peter compares Paul's epistles, his letters to the churches, as scripture. Notice, ver the beginning of the verse, as also in all his epistles, talking about Paul, notice the last part of the verse, as they do also the other scriptures. Peter here was considering Paul's letters as much the inspired word of God as he was the Old Testament. And that's important. That is a verse that proves that 
the word of God is just that, the inspired, infallible word of God. Now let's read the last two verses and we'll wrap up here. The verse 17, you therefore beloved seeing, you know these things before, but where lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. We should continually be growing in God's grace. What is God's grace? Grace is favor freely bestowed. God has not only in his mercy withheld the judgment that was due all of us, he also freely bestowed favor upon us. He could have just not given us hell, but he also then gave us heaven in his grace. So what is grace? Grace is favor bestowed. We are saved by grace. Ephesians 2, 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we should grow in grace. What is grace? It's God's favor. We are able to grow in the favor that God has given us. But, get this, if we're to grow in grace, where does grace come from? God. So the only way that we are to grow spiritually is because of God. As soon as our own human effort or uh, our uh, human our human effort intrudes, then our growth stops. The only way we're going to grow in the Lord and grow closer to him and be able to live more like him is going to be with God's help, growing in grace. And since the Bible is the only reliable source of, source of truth about God, we must study and learn more about him, become more like him, and ultimately grow in grace.